Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Tonight, we'll be learning all about growing your own tea garden, and we will get started in just a moment. But before we jump in, I'd like to feature another great thing you can do with your library card, and that is to access free ebooks and e audiobooks. If you're a person who uses a tablet or Kindle to read books, or if you love listening to audiobooks like I do, you should definitely download the Libby app. It's very easy to use and it's totally free. And if you're not tech savvy and you need some help, you can just call or pop into a library branch and I guarantee there will be someone there who would love to help you. It's an awesome perk of having a library card and I hope you'll give it a try. So with that, let's move on to our program this evening and learn all about growing tea. I'll pass it over now to our coordinator, Gail. Take it away. Thank you, Serenity. And uh, thanks for, again, sharing all the good features and capabilities we have with um, uh, using our library cards. So this is a, another wonderful app that the, uh, the library has. So I um, want to welcome everybody to tonight's um, program, and we are speaking tonight on uh, My Cup of Tea, Growing an Herbal Tea Garden. So my name is Gail Burt. I am a Master Gardener uh, volunteer and tonight's moderator. I would uh, like to thank the uh, Contra Costa County Library, who is our co-sponsor, along with the University of California Master Gardeners in sponsoring this webinar. Uh, many of you have probably uh, joined sessions in the past, but uh, for those of you who uh, may be first time, I'll go over just a few uh, items that are on this slide here. Uh, first of all, you'll all be muted. Um, so, we encourage you to ask questions, but you'll need to do that in the Q&A icon that is at the bottom of your screen. So please uh, please enter any questions that you may have for our speaker. We have uh, also three very talented Master Gardener volunteers, Holly, Bonnie, and Lydia are all working in the background, uh, supporting us in answering your questions. Uh, we do record this um, program for educational purposes, and we also uh, provide it as a YouTube um, program later. Uh, you'll have live cap um, closed captioning available, and at the very end of this program, a, uh, an excellent handout has been assembled, so you'll want to stick around and be able to get uh, access to that information. So our mission as a Master Gardener program of Contra Costa County is to extend research-based knowledge and information on home horticulture, pest management, and sustainable landscaping practices to the residents of the Contra Costa County. So we welcome you and thank you for being here tonight. Uh, tonight's speaker is Andrea Salzman. She has been a Master Gardener volunteer since 2019 and holds a gold badge for volunteering over a thousand hours. She has deep passion for learning and facilitating knowledge sharing with others. Previously, the UC Master Gardener Speakers Bureau lead, Andrea, in partnership with the Contra Costa County Library, started our monthly webinars and the YouTube channel by adding three um, dozen new educational talks. Andrea currently is a speaker and educator in our Growing Gardener, Speakers Bureau, and Community, community Garden programs. Andrea loves year-round edible gardening and finds creative uses for the things she grows. Her greatest gardening joy is growing and creating interesting things with her youngest daughter and watching her older daughter harvest and make her own creations with what's growing fresh in their garden. So with that, uh, welcome, Andrea, and I'm going to turn it over. Great. Thanks, Gail, for that nice introduction. And thanks, Serenity, again, for um, co-hosting this with our program. And welcome, everyone. And I just happened to stumble across um, something on social media today that is very timely. Um, 
it's kind of unbelievable a little bit. Uh, and I had to check to make sure that the date was correct. But um, as luck would have it, this webinar we're giving on International Tea Day. <laughs> so thank you for joining us during your evening. But um, cheers, it's also International Tea Day. So what a great day to have this program. I do want to say that this program, um, and I'm not going to get a little too choked up, but this is dedicated to my youngest daughter. Um, it is with her that um, I dreamed and we dream, dreamt together of growing an herbal tea garden. Um, you know, as your children get older, you try to look for different ways to connect with them beyond, you know, they grow up from taking them to a park or playing a puzzle. Um, it was this, her interest in growing and specifically what can we grow to make tea? Um, we fostered this curiosity, um, began and we still have been growing at Herbal Tea Garden for four or five years now. Um, so I really dedicate this talk to her and it's out of kind of this love that we've shared together of doing this project that this, um, this presentation has come together. So it's a real kind of passion project, so to speak. So getting into the program, let me make sure my slides can advance here. <clears throat> there we go. We have a poll to kick it off. Um, I'll let Gail go ahead and uh, launch that poll because I want to hear from you, everyone that's here. I'm assuming that you have an interest in tea, but what kind of tea um, do you enjoy? I would love to hear that um, because all of these options that are on here, I'm going to be touching on a little bit in the beginning with some and a lot of it the rest of the time. So go ahead and I'll give you a minute or so to cast your vote and then we'll share the poll and see what all of you are thinking. And no surprising, herbal tea is trending the highest. <laughs> so that is no surprise. Okay, it looks like the votes have slowed down. Maybe we could share the results with everyone, see what we've got. All right, so highest 82% of you that cast your vote or enjoy herbal tea. So we're gonna talk about a lot of that. Almost um, half of you enjoy black tea, 52% um, of you green tea, a few like white tea. And interestingly enough, we'll come back to this, 28% say you like non-caffeinated tea, um, but some like the caffeine. So we'll talk about all of those. So it's good to see, we've got a lot of tea lovers um, in the audience, so it's good to know. So before we get started um, with um, talking about all different tea, let's first share with you what we're going to talk about. I want to start really kind of at the very foundational of what is tea um, and then what are some really great reasons to grow an herbal tea garden. I'll talk about proper cultural care. So these are the things that you could do in your garden to help ensure the success to get the best plant and the best harvest for your tea garden. Um, I'm going to talk about my what I consider my top 10 herbal tea plant varieties, and I'll be talking about all sorts of things with them, good cultural care, growing tips, and how to enjoy them in tea. Then we'll talk a little bit about after all the hard work of growing is done, how do you harvest, when do you harvest, how to store, how to wash, and then of course ways to enjoy your tea. So that's what we'll be um, talking through in tonight's program. So really starting at the beginning, what is tea? Tea has been around for centuries. There is a legend that in 2732 BC, um, or, um, original tea was first discovered when the leaves of a Camellia sinensis plant floated into Emperor Shang Nong's teapot of boiling tea. There um, on that, I imagine him sitting in front of a river, he sipped the first tea. So most interestingly enough, while that story seems interesting, we're going to come back to Camellia sinensis. Most tea that we know today isn't actual true tea. True tea is actually comes from the plant Camellia sinensis. This is an evergreen tree. Um, it grows very well in subtropical climates. It can grow in a USDA zone seven through nine and USDA uh, zone nine, we have a little bit of that in central and west county here in Contra Costa County. However, we're definitely not subtropical. So if you try to grow that in those zones, um, you're going to need to overwinter it in a greenhouse, in a high hoop house, because think it needs that warm, cozy, subtropical type of environment that won't do well in our colder, where we even get frost in the winter. So it is pretty difficult to grow Camellia sinensis plant here, but a lot of the tea that you might enjoy, 
you might not even realize um, is from the Camellia plant. So that is black tea, uh, white tea, green tea, matcha, and oolong tea. All of these different, you know, names of tea, they all contain caffeine. So they are all caffeinated. So if you need that caffeine zolch, those are the type of teas um, that you'll want to grow for. Um, how, when the plant is harvested um, is really depending on how it gets its name. So for example, white tea. That comes from the part of the plant, you know, when a new leaf first grow is growing, like you kind of see here in this drawing, the tips are still folded together. They haven't opened up yet. Those are the parts of the Camellia sinensis that are harvested for white tea. Um, green tea, on the other hand, are going to be also new growth but the ones that have are opened up. So if you look at, um, you know, in the spring, a tree, you might see some leaves are maybe a little bit waxier and a little bit lighter green, that's the new growth. So after they've opened up, that is what would be taken for green tea. Black tea is gonna be just the regular leaves of Camellia sinensis that are highly oxidized. Oolong tea is taking the same type of leaves from the Camellia sinensis, but just partially um, oxidizing it. Um, and then matcha is ground up green tea, also from shade green, shade grown Camellia sinensis. So it's crazy, all these different processes and methods, it's all going to be caffeinated. And all those all varieties of tea are from that single type of plant. However, today we're not going to be talking about that plant we're gonna be focusing on herbal teas. So unlike the other teas I talked about that contain caffeine, herbal tea is caffeine free. There are a lot of different names or things that you might see herbal tea called, um, such as tisanes, infusions, botanicals, or simply herbal tea. So those all mean the same thing, just different ways to call um, herbal tea. In tonight's presentation, I'll be referring to it as herbal tea. So what makes up herbal tea? We talked about Camellia sinensis and what makes that caffeine tea. What makes herbal tea are these five wonderful things. It could be one of these things on its own or a combination of them. So herbal tea could be made from herbs. And what is an herb? Herb is any plant that you grow for its fragrance. So think of like lavender that has that distinct smell. Um, it for a flower. So uh, we'll be talking about this plant right here, um, which is an edible flower um, and can be used for tea or it's um, used for medicinal value. Um, so those make up herbs and those items could be used for herbal tea. They also could be flowers. And remember, not all flowers are edible. So you really want to make sure before you eat a flower um, that you familiarize yourself if it's safe for um, consumption. So picture here is this beautiful um, hibiscus flower, which is a great um, plant to grow. Beautiful flowers, makes beautiful tasting and colorful teas. Also fruits can be put in herbal teas. Think dried blueberries, dried apples, um, citrus peels, citrus, dried citrus slices. Those all can be used, uh, those type of fruits in an herbal tea. Think about the lovely taste those might add. Bark is another thing that could be used for herbal tea. And you see in this picture right here, we have cinnamon sticks. Uh, cinnamon is a really lovely warming spice that's great in a tea. Herbal teas can also be made from roots. So think of things like ginger, turmeric, uh, dandelion root, licorice root, um, ashwagandha, just to name a few. So any of those type of things um, can be made up a tea. So, you know, interesting, I grabbed a couple tea bags from my cabinet and I'm gonna read off the back of them just to point out what components of these um, herbal tea qualities are in here. So this first one that I have, it's called a turmeric tea. So it contains, it looks like 100% turmeric. So again, turmeric is a root. So that's what makes that an herbal tea. I also have a dandelion leaf and a dandelion root tea that contains dandelion, the leaf and the root. You could also look at something like pure peppermint um, that contains an herb um, that is, you know, that is considered um, what you can make for tea. And then somehow quite a few things this has chicory root and skullcap, which is an herb, cinnamon bark, stevia, 
um, all sorts of different things. So take a peek at those tea bags in your um, cabinet and see which flavors that you like. You might be able to kind of pick out some things that you might like to enjoy in your tea garden. So now that we know a little bit about what tea is and specifically herbal tea, um, I wanna share with you some of the reasons why I love growing a tea garden, kind of inspired my daughter and I to start this passion project a number of years ago. There is something pretty special about being able to kind of cultivate your own cup of artisanal tea, you know, to say, um, hey, I grew all of these things. You also can tailor it to your flavor and taste preference. So I have lots of different jars of dried herbal tea components. Um, you can see Julia in this picture. You can see a bunch of different colors. Um, I see dried mint. I see dried mandarin peels. There's probably rose petals in there, lavender. You could kind of say, what do I feel like today? And grab a little of this, a little of that, and make it specifically to your taste preference for that night. A lot going back to, you know, herbal tea could be made up of things that have medicinal value. There are a lot of health benefits for a lot of the ingredients in herbal tea. So that has some added value as well. It's also cost effective. Um, you know, you'll be growing jars and jars before you know it <laughs> of dried tea. I have a whole cabinet full of it. Um, so it does become quite cost effective. And there's just the pure joy of growing and making something um, from your own garden and from your heart. If you have attended any of our webinars in the past, you have likely seen this slide. This is um, the four foundations for success. This is what we as master gardeners refer to as good cultural practices. These are really important components, whether you're buying a plant for your tea garden or you know, your vegetable garden or your landscape to really make sure you understand what are the soil needs of that plant, what are the water needs of that plant, what type of aeration is needed, you know, below the soil and around the plant? Um, and what is the sun requirements for the plant? You know, they're different for each plant. So you need to make sure that you understand those things so that you can cultivate the right place in your garden and give them the right conditions, whether it be water, aeration, et cetera, to really grow that plant successfully. And as I talk through each of the top 10 herb plants uh, for Herbal Tea Garden tonight, I will touch on each of these for most of the plants so that you'll know to be successful, kind of what are the soil, water, sun, and aeration for each of those plants. So let's talk about sun. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time about both sun and water. Some of the things that we see that if we had to say, what are the two top reasons that folks, plants commonly fail to grow? It's because there weren't the right light hours, not enough sun or maybe too much or too little. And, um, and the water wasn't quite right. So I wanna spend a little time talking about that. When I get to talking about the top 10 tea plants, you're gonna hear me say things like full sun or partial sun. So what exactly does that mean? And you probably will also see that when you go to the garden to buy a plant or to research a plant or to start seeds. So it's really important to know that to make sure that you have that sun requirement for that plant before you spend money on it, um, you know, to put it in your garden. So full sun is something that is gonna be six plus hours a day of sunlight. So these are a lot of plants that require their fruits. There are a lot of the tea plants that we're gonna be talking about today that are full sun. Um, a, a number of other tea plants, some that have more tender leaves can do with, uh, full sun or even partial sun. So more or half sun, like four hours a day. So most of the herbs and the plants that we're talking about today are gonna fall into that full sun or half sun. So when you hear me say that full sun, you know it's six plus hours. Partial sun, I'm referring to four to six hours a day. Water is also um, really important. That's the other kind of one of the main things that we see why a plant fails or doesn't fail. And, and I wanna point out this picture and give a little bit of a call out to our sister program. Um, the 4-H program is also funded by UC Agriculture and Natural Resource Department. And I was lucky enough to work with the La Mirinda 4-H group um, and teaching um, you know, elementary through high school uh, girls and their parents about how to grow an herbal tea garden this school year. So this was a lesson on soil and water. Um, so I was excited um, that they let me put this in the presentation to give them a shout out for the great program and work that they are doing with um, in their community and with their families. So water, 
um, you need to, when you're grouping plants, whether it be in a pot, in a raised bed, in your landscape, you want to place plants together with similar water and sun needs. So going back to the last slide with sun, say you buy two plants that are both full sun, require six plus hours. If one is uh, like low water plant and one's a regular water plant, those are gonna be incompatible to place next to each other because you're gonna overwater one and underwater another. So really um, look at not only the sun requirements, but the water requirements and group those plants together. So they'll all get what they need and one won't get more or less of what it needs. So when you see something that, and you'll hear me talk tonight to say this plant requires regular water, that really is going to mean that plant, that soil just needs to always be kind of damp, like a wrung out sponge. You don't want it too wet where it's compacting the soil, drowning it, maybe creating root rot, just it always has moisture in it. Low water um, is going to be, it's okay, you won't have to water it as much, it, the soil can get a little bit Taught long, um, drier and drought tolerant will even extend the periods between when you can water. All plants, as a note, require regular water until they're fully established, typically one to two years. So then when you have um, a low or drought tolerant after that first year, you could really then back off on the water. So really make sure you place those plants together. Also know your soil type. Um, if you have clay soil, it's gonna take a lot longer for that water to absorb in the soil than like a sandy soil or a loamy soil. And a loamy soil is something rich in organic matter uh, that looks like kind of crumbled brownies. Um, so know your type of soil. Um, we say in general, regardless of the soil, a best practice for water is really low and slow. So, you know, give it time to slowly absorb, go deep um, so that you could grow really a deep root system. Mulching is also a very great um, way to conserve water um, because it's going to keep the temperature of the soil itself cooler. Um, one thing when you're using mulch, just make sure you don't place it all the way to the stem of the plant. You want to keep it um, a couple inches away from the stem so it doesn't get root rot. You know, it gives that nice aeration around the stem of the plant. Um, some different ideas for mulch. I use straw in my vegetable garden, in my tea bed, um, wood chips. Um, you know, a lot of folks even use like grass clippings or leaf clippings. Those work well um, as well. If you're using containers, a really great way, and this is something our 4-H group did together, um, is we mixed equal parts compost, vermiculite, and perlite, which you could buy at a garden center or easily online. All of those things, the compost, they all help with water retention and the compost will provide a nice um, slow release of nutrients to your soil. And when I've noticed I've started using this combination in pots, especially, uh, I find um, I could go a little bit longer between watering. So it's kind of a really nice alternative if you're using pots to reduce water and keep your, um, your beautiful plant fed. A um, couple other things for a proper cultural care. You want to think about what you want to uh, plant your plant in. Um, you know, you could do anything from a pot in the kitchen to pots outside, uh, raised beds or in the landscape. Um, just again, making sure that you're planting with the right sunlight and that uh, with plants that have the same sun and water needs. The soil needs of plants do vary, um, and we'll talk about that um, in, when we go through the top 10 plants. So really think about that. Most of the plants we're talking about today do really well in like well-draining mix. So I would say, you know, get some good potting mix, um, compost, um, so you don't, especially if, if you're planting in the ground and you have like a heavier clay soil or a sanding soil um, that might drain too fast or too slow, just really mix in some organic material like compost um, and, you know, kind of top dress it with that and that'll help get you there. Um, if you're buying, whether if you're selecting seeds or seedlings at the nursery, really look, make sure you're looking for healthy plants. I per personally like to buy small plants in half inch, one inch, two inch pots um, to really get the plants an opportunity to establish a really hardy root system before um, they start fruiting and flowering. So those are some other cultural considerations. I want to spend a little bit of time before I get in the top 10 plants talking about plant life cycles. This is really important so that you understand when to plant your plants, 
what are the type of pruning needs either um, during the season or after the season, and so that you understand how long your plant is going to live. So all plants are either one of three. They're either an annual, biannual, or a perennial. Today, we're going to be talking about annuals and perennials. So annuals are those plants that grow and bloom for one season. So you'll plant those in the spring, like when you're planting, say, your vegetable garden. They'll grow and produce for you throughout the summer. Um, and then after the first frost, you'll typically cut them back. And when I say cut them back, what I mean is don't yank the whole thing out, just cut it down at the soil level so you'll leave those nice roots in place to be some organic material um, to keep that life beneath your soil um, alive. Perennials on the other year are a more kind of permanent fixture, either in, in a pot, a raised bed, or your landscape. So these are really good things that you could interplant. So maybe you find a place in your garden that you're, you know, you're okay having them there year round or a bed that, you know, I'm fine with that plant being there all the time. So these are things that are going to grow and produce year after year. Typically after the growing season, you'll cut them back, they'll die back, and then they'll regrow in the spring. So I'm going to be sharing my top 10 tea plants. This is what we're all here to learn about. But those cultural considerations are super important to help you be successful at growing these plants. Um, I There are so many possibilities for tea plants. Um, I picked my top 10 to share with you tonight. Um, in the handout, you'll see a number of books that you could go and explore the many, many other options. Um, but I'm looking forward to sharing these 10 with you tonight. When I talk through the plants, look at the different size, color, texture of the leaves, of the foliage. Look at the different shapes and colors of the, um, of the flowers and the different heights of the plant. They all are gonna add such unique, different um, beauty to your garden, whether it's just, you know, in a, in a pot or intermixed, uh, you know, among your landscape garden. So look at that as I talk through them and I um, will look forward to sharing them with you. So I've broken them up in between annuals and um, perennials. So we're going to start with annuals. Again, these are, um, you grow them for one year. So these, um, I, uh, the only particular order that these are is uh, alphabetical, <laughs> so I didn't like pick my favorites. However, if I had to pick a favorite to start with, it would truly be this plant. This is like, I love, love, love this plant. Tulsi Holy Basil um, is the name of this plant. This plant originally came from India, where um, Tulsi translates to the incomparable one. And to me, it is really incomparable. Uh, it is such a beautiful plant. The scent is amazing. Um, and I love the medicinal values of this plant. This plant, um, the medicinal values that it can, um, you know, you can benefit from is it is a really good plant to help relieve stress, um, which is maybe why I enjoy it in my tea <laughs> so often. But I also really love and adore the taste. The taste is really where, if you think of culinary basil, it's more savory. Tulsi holy basil is sweet. It's got that clovey, licorice-y kind of smell. Um, there are multiple varieties. There's four that I found. Um, I am growing three in my garden right now. Um, Kapoor is my favorite. And Kapoor is a little bit, um, it's a lot sweeter um, uh, in taste. Um, some of the other ones uh, like Rama or Amara are a little bit more clovey and musty, musky. Um, and, but they're all just very lovely. Um, they are a petite plant. So when you're looking at where to plant them, um, think about the size. Um, and they grow about one to two feet tall and wide. So if you think about, um, you know, if you're staggering plants, if you're growing something really big next to a little plant like Tulsi Holy Basil, um, you want to make sure that you give it the light requirement and it doesn't cover it up. Tulsi Holy Basil does require six plus hours. It is a full sun plant. So if you're going to be growing it, say, in the same container as, say, lemon verbena, which I'm going to be talking about, that might overtower Tulsi basil. You're not going to get that big of a plant because um, it's not going to have enough sun. So when you're interplanting, just make sure you're positioning that this beautiful petite plant in enough in, in you know, in a place where it's going to get enough light. That's the main thing. Um, type of soil, like most of these plants, it likes loamy, well-drained soil. Um, the best time to plant it is in the spring. 
So just like when you plant your culinary basil, um, you know, same time you're planting your regular um, um, summer garden. So that's the time that you wanna uh, plant Tulsi Holy Basil. You'll see it is a really pretty plant, has more lime green leaves and the stems and the flowers are purple. So this is kind of end of season. I took a little clipping um, with flowers, but one good cultural care to continue the growth of this plant is during its annual life cycle to always pinch back these flowers. So let me do a little zoom, zoomy action here. What, how you would do that. So some of these at the end of season, I like to dry to save seeds, but I like, I'm constantly going out there and looking for the starts of a flower and I'll just pinch it off with my finger. It's really tender and easy to do. If it gets a little longer, you can also use your finger, or just get some pruners and you would just literally clip it off right here. Um, that's going to keep growing the plant and growing. Once it all flowers, it's not really going to grow much further. So really um, be cognizant of constantly going out there and trimming the flowers. Also, a really great way to get a bushier basil plant is to um, trim the center. What you'll notice is a lot of the, um, the leaves are going to grow. You'll see a, kind of a single main stem, and then off of it to the right and left will be some more leaves. That center stem you'll want to go and clip off. Um, because then it will encourage a wider, bushier uh, plant. So when I'm going to like harvest this plant, I'm also pruning it. So what I do is I look for that, that tall center stem and I clip it down. Then I go to the next stem and I clip it down. So what I'm doing is I'm harvesting my Tulsi basil to wash and dry, but at the same time, I'm pruning the plant. So you're kind of serving two purposes at the same time. Um, and then this shows um, kind of Tulsi basil when I'm drying it. And at the end, I will um, tell you all about how to do that. The next plant that I look forward to telling you, talking to you about is chamomile. Um, so Tulsi might be number one in my heart, but I would bet if um, a tea plant had a popularity contest, chamomile would likely win. <laughs> um, chamomile comes from the Greek word. It literally translates to apple on the ground um, because it's a perfect way to describe how chamomile smells. Uh, when you smell those flowers, um, it really smells like just kind of a fresh apple that's just been cut. So whereas with Tulsi basil, you're gonna be harvesting the leaves, um, chamomile, you'll be harvesting the flowers. So how do you know when to harvest them? Um, you're gonna harvest chamomile when it kind of, the, the size of the yellow in the center gets to about the size of an eraser head. And let me zoom in a little bit again to show you. <clears throat> you could see, this is a perfect example right here. Um, this center one with the little hands going around. See how it's perfectly kind of fluffy and it's rounded. That is a um, that is a chamomile that's ready to be harvested. You can see down here, this is some new growth, haven't quite grown fully yet. There are some others that you could see, and it's, um, let me see if, it, you could see right here, it's not fully round. It's a little bit kind of fluffier at the bottom and not as fluffy in the center. Once that kind of fluffiness <laughs> kind of fills up and it's really all round like this one, that's when it's gonna be a good time to harvest. So how do you harvest it? You're gonna harvest it just above the node. What a node is where the stem meets the leaf. So you'll just follow this stem down to where it hits a leaf and snip it off. Um, and then you could cut the stem off and just keep the flower. So that's a little bit about chamomile. Um, where to grow it? It is a full sun plant. So you do wanna find a location with uh, four plus hours or six plus hours of sun. Um, you'll want to plant this in the springtime um, so that you could get the biggest harvest from it. Um, you do want to water it regularly, just like Tulsi basil. Um, and it will, it does want like loamy, well-draining soil as well. So similar um, consistencies. And one thing I want to note, if you um, fill out the survey at the end, you'll get the link to the handout. All of these cultural cares that I'm talking about will be on the handout along with pictures. So um, don't worry about having to write all of this down. Um, it'll be in the handout for you. Um, once this plant is established, though, you can back off on the water. So once you start seeing it really shoot up and get to about 
it's full height. This will get to about two feet tall, maybe one feet wide. Once it gets to that full height, you can back off water quite a bit and it, it, the watering needs are a bit low, but they are regular to begin with. Um, this is also an annual. So at the end of the season, um, you'll just trim down to the ground. Uh, at the end of the season, something I like doing is leaving some of these flowers on um, because it will, um, you know, it self sows very easily. Um, so if you let the flowers dry and then all of the seeds drop, uh, you, you'll likely see some of those plants grow at the beginning of the year. This is also really, if you're looking for a tea plant to start by seed, this is a really, this is what I encourage you to try. Um, it almost looks like just shredded almost pencils or something, or it's just so fine. Um, the seeds are super tiny. So for seeds that look papery, small like that, just wet the surface, sprinkle the seeds on top, kind of press it down with your hand and then water and just keep watering it until it germinates. So this is a really great one. If you want to try your hand at um, starting something from seed, I would recommend that. All right. So those are our two annuals. Now I'm going to get on to perennials. And again, perennials are those plants that have kind of a um, year after year presence in your garden. <clears throat> These do require a little bit more pruning, um, either um, during season, but also after the growing season. And I'll talk about that. So you'll see at the end, I'll, I'll, I have a little slide that says, try something new. Um, and the, the plant that I have that on is one of my favorites that I tried new a number of years ago. Um, Anna's Hysop was high on my list for years. I finally got around to growing it last year. Um, and it is one of my favorites. It's a really, really great uh, perennial plant um, and an excellent tea, gar uh, tea plant. So for this plant, uh, for tea, you can use both the leaves and the flowers um, for tea. Um, these flowers, they're gorgeous too. Um, the pollinators love them. Um, hummingbirds, butterflies, beneficial insects, um, bees adore this plant so much that I have to go out to harvest this plant or prune and take care of it earlier in the morning uh, before the sun kind of comes out and the bees get busy because um, otherwise there's just bees everywhere as you can see from this picture down here. Um, these flowers are just filled, filled with nectar. So you'll see a lot of really fun things um, visiting your garden if you choose to grow this. This plant also has kind of a um, licorice type taste. Um, so it has a really distinct, really delicious flavor. Um, to encourage, well, you do want to plant this in full sun. So this is another full sun lover, also in well-draining soil. And um, this once you, it does require regular water. Once it's established, so like after the second year, um, you know, you can back off the water a little bit, especially if you live in an area that has coastal influences where there's more moisture in the air, it is considered more of a low water plant. Um, how do you keep kind of, what do you do during the growing season? To keep the flowers coming, you'll wanna regularly deadhead the flowers. Um, to keep those flowers kind of from growing um, back during the growing season. Um, or if you're not as concerned about that and you're fine with how much your plant has grown, you could let the flowers dry. Um, the birds will definitely then come visit them and eat the seeds off the flowers. Also similar to basil, to get encourage a bushier plant, you'll want to, you know, just go down and trim right above um, a node. So where the stem meets the a leaf. Um, and then that'll kind of create lateral growth. So you could see that in this picture here. Let me try zooming in. Oops. There we go. So you could see I trimmed right at a node. And then from there, it created some stems that branched off in multiple places from this one place. So really getting a really fuller, bushier plant. So um, it's a great way when you're wanting to harvest it to just kind of go down, you know, maybe you want to manage the height of this plant and just do it right above a node and you'll see it get a lot bushier. Um, so it is in the mint family, so it does grow via rhizomes. So you might see from the next year to the next year, it gets wider and wider. Um, so for that matter, um, make sure you give it adequate space. A container might be a good option, but it also is a really pretty like um, in the landscape as like a, a hedge or a pathway plant. Um, it grows about three feet tall and two feet wide. So that is Anna's Hysop. Love this plant. 
uh, one other beautiful thing about this plant, the new the new growth that forms, I always like to look at it because it, the centers are purple. And then as they grow and mature, it turns to this beautiful green and um, the texture of the leaves are quite pretty as well. Another super popular plant, I love this plant, um, is calendula. And you'll see a couple of plants. Um, calendula is the genus and the species is officinalis. Um, when you see a plant that says officinalis, that is kind of um, indicating a plant that was originally used, you know, centuries ago for um, medicinal purposes. So calendula is one of those. It's really a really um, nourishing plant. Um, so if you have extra and you want to try your hand at making like lip balms or hand lotions, it's really great to help with like cellular repair. As a tea plant, um, it has like a nice peppery flavor and taste and you will be harvesting the petals for your tea. This does like full sun and it's a good plant to plant late summer um, through the fall. Um, and it will like it's a perennial, so it'll keep growing year after year. It does need a moderate water. Um, so again, it's a, like most of these plants, it requires moderate water. Couple things, this plant, most, a lot of these plants I'm talking about don't have a lot of um, pest or disease issues. Um, this particular plant could be susceptible to a couple things, cucumber virus um, or powdery mildew. Cucumber virus is, um, it's kind of transmitted by aphids. So keep an eye out on your plant. If you see aphids, uh, which are those really small plant um, that you, um, bugs that you might see like on rose bushes, just give your plant a good hose off in the morning. That kind of flush of water typically will kind of flush the aphids off it. Um, if not, you might just wanna clip out any diseased um, uh, plants from your bed. The other thing that it might experience is powdery mildew. Powdery mildew puts almost like a gray white uh, film on the leaves of the plants. Um, so if you've ever grown like cucumbers or um, uh, squash, you might've seen this late season. That's very typical, those type of curcubits get. If that happens, it probably means a couple things. Um, you could, I would clip off the infected parts of the plant and then also look to see what the air circulation's like. If, if you have plants growing too closely or if the plant has become, you know, so lush with foliage or flowers, do a little pruning so that you get nice air around the plant and between the stems and leaves. Um, that's going to really help um, keep at bay that uh, powdery mildew. So when do you harvest these plants? Um, so you, they grow to about two to three inches across. So you can see this picture here. Um, I have, you know, average size hand, it's about the size of three or three and a half of my fingers. So when the flower grows to that size is when you'll want to, um, uh, to harvest it. So same thing, just follow the stem down to a node and clip it off. And keep an eye out, um, the next kind of bud might be very close. So what I usually do as I'm harvesting a flower, I'll follow the stem down to our, um, the, the leaf where I see the next, um, the node where I see the next bud formed, and I'll just clip above that. And then I'll clip the stem off. The, um, the, the stem does release like a white, milky, sticky substance. I personally don't like how that feels on my hands. So where most things in the garden, I've got my hands in it. When I um, harvest calendula, I do put gloves on. So if that's something that bugs you too, just uh, make sure to wear gloves. Um, let's see, that is calendula. And you know, this plant, it's funny. Sometimes it's said that in our county, it's a short-lived perennial. I've had it growing in my garden for about four years. And I almost thought I lost this plant this year. It was looking pretty sad, lots of powdery mildew. I let the lemon balm get a little too close to it. So what I did during the winter time is I just kind of pruned it out pretty um, aggressively and kept what I thought looked like the healthiest um, stems. And now it's like larger than the plant ever has been. So it's kind of my note to myself that some of that healthy pruning is good to do um, along, you know, during the growing season and after. You don't have to hack it down or anything, just kind of clip out any diseased areas and just keep that air circulation going. So the next plant that I want to talk about is lavender. 
Um, there are several different species, like three or four species of lavender. When you're looking at using lavender for culinary purpose, you do want to look for, um, they'll all say lavandula, that's this uh, genus. The species that you want to use is um, angustifolia. Folia, excuse me, I knew I'd butcher that. <laughs> um, this is kind of the true English lavender. This is the one that you wanna use for culinary purpose. It's gonna have a lower oil content, so you won't get that soapy taste. So if you, some people, you know, um, oh gosh, I don't like lavender because it tastes so soapy. Well, it's probably, it had one of the other varieties that have a higher oil content and are, it will give off that soapy vibe. So um, really look for um, a plant that has this species. Some common varieties um, that you might see in the plant um, in the nurseries for this species are Munstead, that's a really popular one. Um, Melissa, that's another popular one. Um, so those are some of the, and I think there's a couple that are called um, Elegance. Um, so look for the, that if you're gonna wanna grow lavender in your yard. And lavender comes in purple, uh, pink or white flowers. Purple is the most common. Um, most common is that beautiful green gray foliage. Uh, a couple years ago, a variegated foliage, yellow green foliage was um, offered as well, which adds a beautiful ornamental aspect, um, pop of color um, when the flowers aren't blooming. So there's a lot of variety and it really attracts beneficial insects as well. Um, lots of bees and other uh, friends visit uh, the lavender throughout the growing season. Uh, fall is the best time to plant this plant um, to give it time to establish. Uh, you could also plant it in the spring. That's fine as well. Uh, but fall is going to be the best time to plant it. You definitely need full sun. Um, this plant, depending on the variety, could get two to four feet tall and wide. The, this variety that you'll grow for a tea garden, they tend to be more petite and compact, more one to two feet tall and wide. Um, so they do make excellent choices for containers. Um, so you want to make sure too that you're planting, if you're planting more than one, that you space them um, one to two feet apart so that you have enough air circulation. And I talked earlier about mulch. This is one plant you don't want to really mulch too closely to the plant. Um, it is susceptible to root rot. So if you, um, you know, overwater this plant or have too much mulch where that water is heavy on the roots for a long time, that might affect um, the viability and life of that plant. So this does require full sun. That six plus hours, well draining soil is super important for this plant because it's not gonna wanna sit in a wet environment for long. Um, and once it's established though, so after the first or second year, it is more drought tolerant. So you could really back that water off it significantly. So that's a nice plus for your water bill. Um, you do, we'll have to do pruning um, either one to two times a year. First time could be in the spring. Uh, the first couple of years, it's not recommended you prune at any more than like a third of the plant at a time. And you wanna make sure you prune it down to at least keep one bud still on the plant. Then you'll have your spring flush and it will grow. After the growing season in the fall, you could also prune it one more time. Um, and when you're harvesting this plant, you want to harvest it and you're harvesting it for its flower. That's what you're going to be using for tea um, once those flowers have fully opened. So how you'll harvest it is you'll just follow. You'll see the flowers at the top. You'll go down um, where the stem ends and just cut it down. So when you have large shrubs like this, this was at a lavender you pick that we like to go to every year. I just will grab a handful of it and then just take my clippers and cut it all the way down. Um, and then we'll dry it and I'll tell you later how to dry it. So lavender is lovely, love lavender. It has a really lovely taste and it's very relaxing. That's kind of its um, medicinal value. Lemon balm, you see this is a, a long used uh, medicinal value plant, has the officinalis at the end. Um, the spring is the best plant time to plant lemon balm and you wanna plant it in full sun. Even partial sun is fine. It has a little bit of more tender leaves. So a little less sunlight is fine for this plant. Um, it prefer, prefers same, just kind of your average loamy soil. Um, so again, if you don't have that, just make sure you amend it. So you have that nice well draining soil. Um, and then you'll, it'll be, you know, permanent place in your yard. Um, it is in the mint family also. Um, so it does grow via rhizomes. 
So it is a good choice for a container plant um, if you want to control the size. I have it in the corner of my bed, as you can see, um, and I just have to spend a lot of time to really contain it to that space. Um, like most of these plants, um, you want to harvest this plant before it flowers. So I'm usually just kind of out there clipping it because I like to keep it to a certain height. Um, so you'll just do the same thing as I've described with the other plants. You'll just go down and trim it right above a node. Um, and, you know, don't trim any more than like a third or half of the plant, um, you know, at a time. Um, so just go out there and you'll be shaping the plant and also um, trimming it as well. At the end of the season, um, late winter, you will just kind of cut it back pretty aggressively. I cut it back almost to the ground. Um, and you could see this picture right here is of early spring. So I kind of cut it down to the ground. You could see it's over a foot tall by the springtime. Uh, my plant now, this same plant is several feet tall. Um, another benefit of um, harvesting the plant before it flowers. And again, why you wanna do that is because the plant will have its highest oil content, so it's best flavor if you harvest it before it flowers. This plant also very readily reseeds. So the end of the season got a little lazy. Oh, I wanna see the flowers. I just left the flowers. Well, what happened through the winter and spring is all around this, uh, the front and the side of this raised bed, I have volunteers. So our last meeting with our with the 4-H girls, I I dug up the roots of all of these, um, you know, lemon balm plants that self sowed on the side of my plant, and I put them in a um, in a seed flat and was able to give them away. And I have some that to give away to friends as well. So hey, maybe that's an added value, but I am picking quite a bit of it out everywhere. <laughs> So, you know, that's another added value to trim it, not only to get the best flavor, but you won't have to be uh, picking out those lemon bombs that really readily reseed. Uh, they're really a beautiful plant, kind of a lighter green with the serrated leaves. And you can see kind of at its peak, um, it gets to the size of, you know, you know, two thirds of the palm of my hand. You do want to just regularly prune it back as I, you might, if it gets a little crowded, see some leaves are browning. So that might be a good time to just thin out your plant. And you could just discard any of those leaves that are brown and save the nice fresh ones for your tea. And as its name says, it has a really, really bright kind of almost a lemony floral taste. So it's a really, really has a really um, distinct flavor. Interesting now, there are, you could buy seeds for lemon balm that are mandarin flavored. So you, if you're interested in a mandarin flavor, you could find a Melissa officinalis that um, is a mandarin flavor. So something fun to try out. Lemon verbena is another lemony type flavor. I would say it's, it's, um, it's uh, more, it, it's not quite as strong lemon. Um, it, it's more of almost like a lemony grass flavor. It's kind of between a, a floral lemon and a lemongrass flavor, but it has a really beautiful um, flavor to it as well. This plant can definitely take full sun and should be planted in full sun. It has a little thicker leaves. It's a really hardy plant. You need to make sure to plant um, enough room for it to grow um, unless you want to keep it smaller. If you grow it in a, a bed like I do, it can get six to even 10 feet tall and wide. And when I talk about pruning perennials, you'll get to see how tall this plant does get. So it does get quite large. So if you're interplanting different plants, think about the sizes that these plants grow. So if you plant like a little Tulsi basil um, next to a lemon verbena, you know, you're not going to get the sun that it needs unless you're constantly pruning that lemon verbena down. Um, this requires good, well-draining soil. Um, the spring or even early fall is a great time to plant lemon verbena. Um, like with some of the other plants I've talked about, you do want to harvest it before it flowers. That's going to give it the best taste. And another thing about harvesting I haven't mentioned is uh, harvesting in the morning is typically um, the best time as well. You're going to have the plant will all be its brightest and have the best flavor. So um, that's another great way, uh, great harvesting tip. 
if you so choose, I do like, because it grows so much, I do like to let some of it flower because this plant grows way more than I can use because I really love the flowers. And I'm going to do a zoom in here. There are these teeny, teeny tiny, pale, pale purple flowers um, that I really like putting um, as foliage and flower arrangements. You can see here some dahlias and it just, it's really light and wispy. So it has some other good uses as well. Um, and it is the leaf that you're harvesting for your tea. Mint. So this might be hard to believe, but there, uh, mint comes in all, uh, about 600 different varieties. I mean, you see pictures here, we've got your standard mint with the bees grubbing on the flowers. Pollinators love these flowers. There's chocolate mint, strawberry mint, there's apple mint. Um, there is, I just recently bought a mango mint that has variegated leaves. So the leaves are yellow and green. So really, really pretty um, foliage in the plant. And like this chocolate mint has chocolate brown stems and the green leaves. Um, these strawberry, the strawberry mint are super, super tiny and petite. Um, so the varieties are endless. So it really gets a lot of great different flavors. Um, you could also in the mint family are peppermint or spearmint. So that has like a higher menthol um, component. So you'll have that kind of stronger pop of that kind of minty, fresh, pepperminty taste. So those are also things that you can grow. Um, they are very invasive. So I do recommend them in a container so that you can contain them. Um, they do, um, full sun is good. If you have a little bit, um, uh, maybe even a little less than full sun, they would do just well as, um, well. I mentioned they're invasive because they have rhizomes that grow underground where they spread. Um, typically they're going to get one to three feet wide and tall. So plan accordingly for your container size or where you're going to be growing them. They also like regular water and well draining soil. Um, like the other plants, it is best to harvest them for the best flavor uh, before they flower. Um, but, you know, I get so much of it. I do always like to leave some of the plant uh, allowing it to flower um, so that the pollinators like this bee um, can come visit it. And, you know, the strawberry mint flowers are super pretty. They're really, really pale pink. So um, they're kind of fun to look at as well. Um, mint, you are harvesting it for the leaves, um, but just as a side note, the flowers on mint are edible. So if you want to use them for something else um, in your for culinary use, you could do that as well. One um, kind of caring for mints, you might notice during the winter that they um, a lot of the foliage will die back. It'll look very woody. You might even think that it's dead. Um, it's not, those rhizomes are alive underground. What I do during the winter time is I just trim back all of the kind of dried stems. Um, and then in the, the fall, um, you know, you'll see that flush of foliage return. So that's some good um, care for the mint. Roses. So we could do like a very long webinar on roses alone. <laughs> so you remember I told you what, you know, fragrance are one of those things that um, you might choose why you choose a plant for a tea. When you're looking at roses and roses do need to be, let me step back, in full sun, um, you could either plant them six weeks before the last frost in the spring or um, six weeks after the first frost in the fall. Um, and you're gonna need to really do some heavy, deep watering um, for that first year until it becomes established. And then you could back off and just regular watering uh, will be fine after that. Um, but you're gonna wanna pick for tea, a variety of roses that has a good nose to it. So my dad likes to comment, gosh, I go to buy roses at the nursery. A lot of them don't have any scent. And yes, some of them have been hybridized so much that they don't have scent anymore. But when you're looking for tea, pick those that have a really lovely nose, you know, that have that really lovely rose scent or like some of these roses here. Um, one of them, this rose right here is a lovely like honey scent. This rose right here is this really kind of apricotty scent. So um, I love picking roses like that that have a good nose because that's what flavor it's going to add to my tea. You can also add uh, rose hips. Rose hips will have vitamin C and some other nutrition nutrients. So um, if you choose to, at the end of the season, not prune off some of your flowers um, after the petals dry off, eventually at the base of 
where the rose was, um, a rose hip will form and it will look like this. Um, and so kind of above this would have been the flower. So you could clip off those rose hips and dry them, grind them up and include them in your tea as well. It has some medicinal value. Um, pruning during the growing season, you're just gonna wanna regularly prune them. Um, so as either you harvest them for tea or the petals dry off, um, you'll wanna go down to a node where you see um, uh, leaves, um, stems that have at least five petals and then cut at a 45 degree angle. Um, and then, you know, the roses will grow back from them. And then in January, February, you're gonna wanna kind of prune back more aggressively, do kind of more of the annual pruning. So that is, those are roses. If you know you don't like growing roses, too much maintenance, don't have the space, another nice, um, another nice option for to get that rose scent in tea are rose scented geraniums. Geraniums are another really great um, variety. Their petals have really high oil content. They have, I mean, so many different scents, but there is one, I grow one in my garden that has rose scented, that is a rose scented geranium. So that's another option as well. And it's a beautiful ornamental plant. So pruning perennials, I have to say, I used to be super scared to prune plants. I thought I was just gonna ruin them and destroy them. So I took a picture of the life of my pruning of this lemon verbena to give a really good example that they're actually helping the plants growth for next year. And you do wanna do that with these perennials. Um, I talked like a little bit about how you would do that for lavender and some of the others using lemon verbena as an example. In the winter, you'll want to find kind of the hardiest stem and trim it back. So I kept it about a foot, foot and a half in length and trimmed all of the, um, you know, kind of stems on the side of it. So it literally looked like just a random stick in my garden. <laughs> but all of those lovely roots are still in place, ready to go to work next season. What you'll see come the spring is this is the same plant. Look at early spring. That new growth is already starting to come back. Late spring, the plant has shot up. I've got enough, it's ready for harvesting. And the summer, um, I said four plus feet, but this bed right here is two feet tall and I'm five foot three. And, you know, even, you know, my hand raised above my head, you know, this is this plant right here is probably about, you know, at least five feet tall and it will grow taller. So um, this plant grows back very, very tall and vigorously, vig vigorously, and it does appreciate that winter uh, pruning. So make sure for your perennials that you're doing your in-season pruning and your after at the end of the season pruning. There are so many other plants that you could consider for tea. I've just shared with you nine and I've saved another one to talk about next, but some other alternatives, you could see my daughter here. She's now 14, so she's just an itty bitty thing here. She's holding a bunch of lemongrass. That's awesome in tea. Citrus, you see my cup barley under a satsuma mandarin tree. Um, when we harvest our satsuma mandarins in the winter, we uh, have a drawer full of the peels that I like to save and grind up and add to tea. Really great, like lovely flavor to tea. You could do hibiscus, lots of herbs, rosemary, sage, fennel, a bee balm, sunflowers, um, and the list goes on and on. There are so many considerations. And again, in the handout, I'll have a couple different books that are really great resources um, that will have like A to Z uh, listing of tea plants that will give you some more ideas. So I mentioned at the beginning, Anna's Hysop was the new plant that I tried last year. I like to kind of try something new. Um, and this is kind of my example of something new that I tried and how fun some of them can be. So this is called Butterfly Pea. I, um, there is a um, shop um, in New Mexico that um, a fellow master gardener friend referred me to years ago that sells loose leaf tea. And I was intrigued by this plant um, because of the color that it turns um, the tea. And I thought, well, purple's my favorite color. Um, I love it. I'm going to try the tea. And then I got to growing it, I, enjoying it and said, I bet you for a lot less money, because it is a little pricey, I bet you I can grow this. Um, so this plant is a full sun plant. Um, so it's going to need six plus hours. Um, it is originally, you know, grown in Thailand. Um, and it is, so it does like that subtropical, um, 
How I suggest growing that, you're not gonna find it in a plant form, but you're gonna need to direct sow the seeds. So um, you need to read the plant, the seed packet instruction for spacing um, and for the depth. Usually you plant a seed the same depth as the thickness of the seed. Um, this plant though, since it is a subtropical, um, it does like the soil 75 to 85 degrees. So um, now is a good time or summer is a good time to plant it. Um, and then from there, you're just gonna have to make sure it's constantly wet because it's gonna need that moisture along with the full sun to germinate the plant. This one, if you go to try it, and I highly encourage you to do it, it's a beautiful plant and a lovely tea plant. Uh, to sip on, it takes about three weeks to germinate. So you're going to be out there watering just blank soil for weeks. Don't worry, hang tough. Um, it will germinate and it will take, it will seem like it's growing so slow at first, but then once it starts growing and it shoots up and it's just profusely flowering and flowering and flowering, it requires very little care. You will need to have a trellis well-drained soil, and I mentioned full sun, so it does need a support structure because it is a climbing vine. Um, it produces these beautiful double flowers, um, and you so you can see from the size of my hand how big they are. And then here's when I pick them. They're halfway dry and then all the way dry, so they do get quite tiny, um, but this tea turns a beautiful shade, and it has kind of a really unique value to change colors. So I am gonna share a video with you because I have the next slide that kind of shows the before and action after of what this tea can do, but I think a full video to show it in action is gonna paint a better picture for you. So take a minute to look at this video. All right, so that's the power of the butterfly pea flower. It is you, beautiful. Adding citrus kind of changes that color. And how does it taste? Like I like lemon water in the morning, but sometimes it's just too acidic tasting. So I've noticed if I enjoy a cup of butterfly pea um, flower in my tea and add citrus, it kind of takes away that edge of the acid flavor. So you get that essence of the lemon without being super acidy. So it's a pretty mild flavor um, tea. It's also really fun to make a simple syrup with. And, um, you know, so you can make mocktails or cocktails with it too. So it's, it's a really fun plant to grow, <clears throat> very rewarding. So that's the top 10. Let's talk quickly through, I've talked a lot about how to harvest. So just quick couple things to remember, you know, keep in mind, are you harvesting the flowers or the leaves? Um, the early morning is the best time. You'll have the highest oil content. Um, and you'll do that once the plant has meet either the leaves or the flowers have reached their full maturity. You'll want to then bring them in the house and wash them. You can wash them in your hand as my daughter's doing with chamomile. Um, I also like to put them in a mesh strainer for flowers and then just kind of rinse water in the sink. 
For things that are more tender greens, like think that lemon balm or other leafy greens, I like to fill up a bowl of water, submerge the whole stem and leaves in the water and kind of gently shake it around. That'll wash off any dust or debris, maybe some bugs that might be in there. And then, you know, I could take it out and dry it. So how do you dry it? There's a couple ways. You could hang dry it. So you can see here, I have some lavender um, that I bundled up, tied it with a bread tie and hung it to a closet. And then I shut the door. Um, you could also air dry it. So you just want to lay it flat. Um, wherever you're drying it, it is recommended that you dry it in the dark. Um, when the light hits some of these plants, it does take away some of the flavor. Um, so to get the best flavor out of it, you want to um, <clears throat> um, dry it in the dark. So <laughs> my family is very patient with me. I have a lot of drawers in our kitchen that have random, you know, tea plants in them and closets that have things hanging as well. So those are two options on how to air dry it. If you're lucky enough to have a dehydrator, um, you know, put that dehydrator on 90 to 115 and um, you could dehydrate those um, plants as well. You can do the oven, however, make sure that you dry it, not bake it. So you wanna put the oven on the very lowest setting and monitor it. You're just gonna wanna dry it in the oven until it's brittle. So you could take a leave and if it crumbles, you know, in your hands, then you'll know that it's done. If it's still a little soft or doesn't crumble easily, it might need a little bit more. So those are some ways to dry it. After you dry it, store it in an airtight container. You could certainly purchase mason jars, they're beautiful, um, but I use old spice containers, I use old jam jars, I use old, you know, roasted bell pepper jars, um, you know, whatever it is, just make sure it's airtight. If you're reusing something like some of those things I talked about, just make sure to sanitize them either in the dishwasher or with really warm soapy water. And then label them. Um, it's easy to lose track especially for the things that are green and leafy. Is that a mint or is that lemon verbena? You could probably tell by the smell, but I like to label it both the name of the plant and the date that I harvest it. Most of these are going to have a shelf life for about one year. So that'll help me know what I need to use first and then what do I need to remove, um, you know, throw away because it's past its shelf life. Just some safety things to think about. You know, I mentioned some of these things do have a medicinal value. Um, so if you have certain health issues or on certain medications, just make sure some of these things don't adversely impact anything and medications or um, any uh, health issues that you have. So it's just always a good thing to check on and be aware of. Also, um, make sure that when you're enjoying tea plants, it's something that you've grown in your garden um, or in a friend's garden that you trust and know that it's how it's grown with the cultural pears. You don't ever want to buy chamomile from the grocery store or a florist and dry it. That, those are usually going to be chemically treated to help preserve the plants. So you don't want to do use store-bought plants of these and dry them for herbs. They could have things that are unsafe for human consumption. So just really keep that in mind as well. And enjoy. You could see here, I mentioned like you mix and match. This, this right here is chamomile, mint, and lavender. This has orange peel, chamomile, and some roses. This has calendula, orange peels, and chamomile. So, I mean, the possibilities and combinations are endless. So before we get into questions and some program information, I'd love to launch our last poll and then hear your questions. All right, so for the last poll, which of the top 10 herbal tea plants do you think that you'll try growing and enjoying? You could try, chime, you could check, pick, excuse me, uh, whichever you like. So go ahead and cast your vote for which tea plant uh, really sparked an interest for you. One of the things while everyone's filling this out, I think it's really fun about growing a tea garden is it's just a, a, um, a way to get you out in the garden. I find, you know, it's kind of fun to try new things and just cultivate different interests and, you know, picking one or two new of these plants a year and enjoying them and sharing them with friends is really a great way to do that. Okay, looks like, um, 
we our poll has slowed down. If we could go ahead and share the results. All right, thank you. So most popular are that anise hyssop and tied with lemon balm, two excellent choices. Uh, anise hyssop, again, a great pollinator plant. Uh, we also have, oh, actually, excuse me, lavender came in at number one, beat, beat out lemon balm and anise hyssop by 1%. Also popular mint um, and calendula, and oh, let me scroll down. Uh, Tulsi holy basil is actually, I'm scrolling down, I didn't see this. That's the most popular, 50% of you are interested in growing that. I hope you enjoy, that's my favorite. So, um, and chamomile is another popular one. So great, I'm gonna close this and uh, I'm gonna go to the next slide and it takes a minute after we close it and let Gail talk a little bit about program information and then we'll get to some questions. Well, thank you, Andrea, and thank you for this incredible talk on growing herbal gardens. This has just been filled with great information. Um, I want to suggest to everybody that we have a lot of information um, that is research-based, so please come visit us on our website, uh, follow us on social media, and if you have any other gardening questions, um, please, by all means, um, contact our help desk. They're happy to be there and help you with uh, any needs you have. So tonight's uh, and, and prior um, talks that we've had, these webinars uh, are recorded. So they will be uh, available on our YouTube site and also through the library. So the Contra Costa County Library also um, posts them on their YouTube site. So you can go back uh, and see any of the programs that you may have missed previously. Um, and we do have quite a few more um, really great topics for the rest of this year. So we hope that you will join us again. Uh, registration is usually um, opened up about a week in advance of the talk. So um, so be on the lookout. The, the uh, library will send a, um, a, a blast as well as the um, Master Gardeners if you're on our uh, mailing list. You will receive a survey from the University of California in a couple months. They just uh, ask how you enjoyed this program. They want to make sure that uh, it's uh, of value to the community and is creating that education that they are all about. So um, do, ex do anticipate that you'll receive something. So um, as mentioned previously, Andrea has put together an excellent handout with more information, detailed information, links to sites that you can uh, get additional information that you want. Please, um, you know, use your phone to connect the um, QR code or uh, perhaps Serenity has a chance to put the link in the, uh, the chat, but um, this will get you um, just to answer a couple of questions and then you will get um, the handout. And I see that Serenity just put the link in the chat. So thank you, Serenity. All right, so um, now we have uh, time for a few questions. And I know that our team has been very, very actively answering questions. There are a few that we think would be really beneficial for everybody. So um, Andrea, if you can, um, please share suggestions about soil blend. You talked a bit about soil at the beginning. What soil blend would you recommend for retaining um, moisture, particularly for potted herbs? Yeah, so um, it really depends on if you're going to be planting it in a pot, which it sounds as, like this person um, who asked the question wanted, and I'll talk about that. Um, or it depends if you're, you know, in a raised bed or if you're doing it in your native soil in your garden. So you really need to know what is the composition like of either, say, your raised bed or your, your um, in-ground soil. Most of these plants are going to, you know, that we've talked about really benefit from well-draining soil. 
So if you are, you know, have more clay soil or sandy soil, I would suggest top dressing with compost that could decompose and add organic material and make that more loamy, um, um, you know, loamy type soil um, for your, you know, either your natural soil or also it's a great way to do every year I do cover crops and then um, compost a couple inches um, in raised beds. Now, if you're looking at pots, the um, combination that I had suggested um, with the picture we showed from the 4-H group is I did equal parts of compost, vermiculite, and perlite. So those three things combined. Um, but if you don't want to go to all the trouble of buying all that, I would just say buy a really high quality potting mix, look at what's in it, make sure it has organic materials. And, you know, I do half that in and half compost and mix that up. Um, the compost will um, give it a lot more um, water retention than just the potting mix alone. So that, those are some suggestions for soil. Very nice. Thank you so much. Um, Second question is, um, a lot of stores will sell mason jar kits for herbs. What's your opinion of these? Mason jars, mason jar sets for herbs. Um, so you can grow herbs as like microgreens. Um, you can't really grow them as sprouts, which, I, which you typically would use like a mason jar for. Um, so I'm not really sure. I've never seen growing mason, growing herbs in mason jar. I would say as long, because you need good drainage. So a mason jar, you know, in and of itself isn't going to have a drainage hole. Um, so I'm not sure that that would be a, a, a container I would select for an herb. I would make sure that it's the size enough, large enough for, you know, at least 12 to in, 18 inches in diameter to plant an herb in has a good potting mix and a drainage hole. Um, mason jars are good for things that you're looking to sprout, so to speak, with just water. Um, so I, I would kind of caution against it, but I have never run across those. So <laughs> but that's just my thought, thinking about the glass jar in itself and what that plant might need. Okay, great. They're probably better suited for storing after. Exactly, <laughs> save them for your storage, you got it. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, containers to put your herb tea blends to give as gifts too. So you know, use it for that too. <laughs> Very good. Um, there's a question: Why does my mint get white soits on the leaves? Do I need to throw this plant out? I wouldn't throw it out. Sometimes, you know, um, as the plant gets a little bit mature, it's not a, like a young, tender leaf anymore. It's probably just time to prune that out. Um, it might just be kind of at the end of its life cycle, might need to just prune it out a little bit. I see mine that if I leave them on a long time, um, they're going to be in the sun for a long time. They might get brown spots. Um, it could be because there's not enough air circulation. I would just kind of prune those out. Um, trust me, mint is going to survive a storm. <laughs> With those rhizomes, it is going to it is going to survive. You know, whatever comes its way. So I would just prune out those that don't look so well, um, and you know, use the fresh leaves. You'll you'll probably have plenty of them. Okay, thank you. Um, can you use pant plant pellets to start from seeds for their herbs. So what I'm guessing you're thinking about from a plant pellet, that's typically coconut flour. A lot of times like growing kits come with like a little pellet. And when you add water, it fluffs up. That's a sterile growing medium. That's a really great medium to use if you're starting herbs from um, seed. Uh, but once, um, the cotyledons will come up first. Next, the true leaves will come up. Once the true leaves form, you're going to need to take it out of that coconut flour, which is a sterile medium, and move it into something that has potting mix, compost, um, to give it nutrients to grow. So it's a good place to start seeds, but then you'll need to move it up once the first true leaves grow. Okay, great. Um, question that came in was around roses, and the person had... Um, sprayed their roses, not necessarily with water. Um, and so the question was, would this be uh, something that you would could still use for consumption? 
Um, so uh, let me just restate it to make sure. So this individual sprayed their rose with water and they're wondering if they could still use that for consumption? Um, not with water, but with um, more of a um, pesticide. Um, so I would say depends on what it is. If you're using an organic, you know, something that is organic, so made of plant material, I would say it would be okay. Um, if you're using it with some type of pesticide, no, I would not. Um, I would not recommend consuming that. Okay, thank you for that. Yep. Um, there's another question. Uh, uh, recently planted a hibiscus plant for tea. Any recommendations or tips? Yeah, so hibiscus is like a subtropical plant. So I would say, you know, it's going to need full sun. Um, it is the flower that you're going to be harvesting. When you harvest the flower, you do want to take the stamen, you know, that has the pollen on it, cut that off, and then wash the flower and dry it. Um, and then you could use the dried leaves for your tea. Um, you, since it is a subtropical plant, you're going to need to overwinter it. So like in a greenhouse, you might want to put a frost cover on it, you know, put Christmas tree lights around it to keep it a little bit warmer, bring it close to the house that will keep it warmer. So during the colder months, um, so that it doesn't get susceptible to the colder freeze. Um Another question that, that came up about storage. So can herbs be stored in a tin container um, without being in the dark or will, will this cause them to get heated up and will that not be good for its um, sort of um, storage and maintenance? No, that's a great question. Um, tea, uh, uh, like tin jars are great because it's gonna keep the light out which will keep the flavor there. Um, this loose leaf tea store that I brought it for, they frequently sell tea in tin jars with nice like sealed lids. So it's a really great option because it, it's not only airtight, but it'll keep the light out, which will keep, um, you know, keep more of the flavor. Um, I keep mine, even though they're in glass containers, I keep them in a drawer in a cabinet. So it's dark as well, but yeah, tin is a great option. Good question. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Andrea. We are um, out of time and we've had a chance to hear a lot of great information. Thank you so much You're for welcome. your um, so uh, educational um, presentation and really want to thank our amazing Q&A team, uh, Bonnie, Holly, Lydia. Thank you very much for doing so much um work behind the scenes so diligently answering questions. I'd like to say thank you to Whitney who did a lot of the um, preparation work with Andrea to put this talk together. And of course, Serenity Dean and the uh, Contra Costa County Library for co-sponsoring this event. We couldn't do it without you. So thank you so much. Thank you all for attending. We couldn't, uh, wouldn't be here without you. So thank you very much and good night. Thank you for chiming in. Have a good evening. Good night. Good night, all.